Okay, uh, we're back, and we're going to be talking about perceptual set. The word set is sort of an old-timey psychology term. You're going to see it in a couple places in the next couple of chapters. Um, it really refers to expectation. It's like you're set to experience something. So in perceptual set, you're set to perceive something given this context. So what we expect to perceive. Um, it's a type of top-down processing, right? If you're all set up for a particular expectation, you're more likely to perceive things through that lens. Um, it's a top-down process. You're going to impose meaning. So, for example, when you see a picture like this, is it the Loch Ness Monster or is it a tree branch? Um, you know, the, the man who took the picture insisted up and down that it was the Loch Ness Monster. And I remember when I was a little kid, there used to be a TV show hosted by Leonard Nimoy called In Search Of. And one episode covered the Loch Ness Monster, and I was probably 10 years old when this aired. And it was pretty convincing. I mean, Spock was telling us that it was photographic evidence of the Loch Ness Monster, and I was really buying it. Well, ultimately, the photographer on his deathbed confessed it was a tree branch. And, um, you know, a lot of people had already said it can't be the Loch Ness Monster. It, it, there's no evidence of motion. But as a 10-year-old, I didn't notice that. I thought, wow, that's the Loch Ness Monster. My perceptual set was all primed to see the Loch Ness Monster. And so I saw it, right? Um, here's another good example of people um, believing, you know, seeing it one way when they believe certain things. Um, these are actually clouds. It's a certain type of cloud that's very dense, and then there's wind that rushes around it in this pattern that causes what looks like flying saucers. I mean, let's admit it, it looks like flying saucers. Uh, it is actually clouds. But um, people who have a perceptual set that it could be um, flying saucers will oftentimes react as though they are flying saucers. And so their expectations cloud their judgment. So what you're expecting to see is oftentimes what you actually end up seeing. All right, there are a couple of other things that I wanted to um, talk about as far as expectations, context, stuff like that. So when we look at the panel on the left, we see a red circle surrounded by four big white circles. Um, versus on the right, we see a big red circle surrounded by four small circles. It turns out that people tend to think that the one on the right looks bigger than the one on the, the red one on the right looks bigger than the red one on the left in um, experimental trials when they've set people up to make judgments. They tend to say that the one on the right looks bigger, even though when we just move the dots, all I did was um, animate them. They're exactly the same. I created these from the same dots. Um, the context is clouding our judgment. So when you are, um, you know, a red dot surrounded by big white circles, it makes you look smaller. When you're a red dot surrounded by little white circles, it makes you look bigger. So context is really super important when we're making our judgments. Um, all right, let's move on to vision. Okay, something I alluded to earlier when I was talking about um, that white background where you got the sensory adaptation after looking at the, at the green birds flying on the red background. White light, which is depicted in this picture on the left side, it's labeled white light, um, is actually made up of the full vis visible spectrum of color. We see this whenever it rains, and the sunlight, which is white, passes through raindrops, which are prisms, and they make rainbows for us. Um, our visible spectrum, us humans, can see this very narrow band of vision where it ranges from about 350 to about 750 um, nanometers um, in wavelengths. And we detect them as the colors that you see on the screen. Other creatures can see in infrared like bees can. Um, we have machines that can detect other wavelengths and we have them all listed there for you. Um, but what we can see is this narrow band. And for you to detect white light, all of the colors need to be present. Um, for you to detect black light, it, everything has to be absent. Now this is different, by the way, from for you guys who are, have had art experience where you're like, wait, I thought that black was, the cre was created by combining all colors. That's in pigment. So um, pigments, we detect their color based on which lights are being absorbed by the pigment. So um, when you put all the colors together in pigment, they absorb all the colors and thus give us the absence of color and we detect it as black. Um, 
So it's kind of inverted in pigment because you're actually measuring what's reflecting off the pigment as opposed to what's being absorbed. It's a little confusing, but I'm just talking about light waves right now. So how does our brain figure out what color um, is coming in and, what, and how bright it is? Well, it's all dependent on the light waves being reflected off of the object. So short wavelengths, meaning from the peak of one wave to the peak of the next, and you can see that here in this illustration. Um, so from the peak of one to the peak of the next, if it's short, you detect that as blue. If it's long, you detect it as red. And the things in the middle, you know, different lengths are, you know, the greens and the yellows and the oranges and like that. Amplitude is what determines brightness. So from the peak of the wave to the valley of the wave is the measure of amplitude of the wave. And so when it's a higher amplitude light wave, you detect it as a bright color. When it's a lower amplitude light wave, you detect it as a dull color, gray, something like that. So when I hold up a nice bright red bottle, it's got high amplitude, long waves, right? When we look at, for example, my gray shirt, it's got small amplitude, probably tending more towards the bluish colors, right? Um, definitely not the red. So different colors are casting off different wavelengths, and that's how you, your eyes detect the color. So how do your eyes detect color? Well, first off, let's spend a little bit of time looking at the anatomy of the eye. I'll bet some of you have had the experience of dissecting an eye. Um, not everybody gets to do that in high school so or even in college. Some of you might have done it in college. Um, so let's go through quickly the main structures. We're not going to hit everything, um, just the ones that really are relevant to um, vision. So let's start with the outer coating of the eye. That's called the cornea. Um, behind the cornea, there's a bubble of fluid. Um, and if you've ever gone to the eye doctor and they do that little puff of air on your eye, it's detecting how much pressure is in your eyeball. If there's a lot of pressure, that puff of air will hit the receptor, bounce off your eyeball and hit the receptor faster than if it's got normal amounts of pressure. Um, so the cornea helps to determine you know, that kind of pressure. Um, behind the iris is the colored part of your eye, the iris. Um, the, color, the iris is actually a muscle, and that muscle is brown. In this picture, you're just seeing the muscle. You're not seeing the colored part of the iris. The iris, um, so the muscle itself is what contracts and opens and closes to let light in. The color of your iris is determined by filaments that are laid down on your eyes, like somebody has dropped a handful of spaghetti, and during fetal development, the iris spins out and casts those filaments out in a radiating pattern and covers the, the brown muscle. If you have light eyes, green or blue or gray or something like that, and you see a brown dot in your eye, a lot of times that's in the actual colored part of your eye, a lot of times that's where you can actually see the iris muscle through the filaments of your of your eye color. Those of us with brown eyes, we have we might we might be able to see our muscle too, but we have brown eyes, so we don't really notice it. Um, each of your irises are unique. In fact, that is probably the best way to, to, to discriminate two individuals from each other better than your fingerprints because sometimes sometimes identical twins will even have the same fingerprints but they never have the same irises um, so iris um, detectors right recognizing you by your irises are, are more unique right that would be a great way to actually tell every individual on earth from each other um, but you have to have this whole store bank of every iris on earth to know and it's those biometrics are very complex. You may you may be using them on your phone. My phone has that where I can hold it up and I can look at it. It does not care for doing it through glasses, though. So, I mean, I don't want to take my glasses off every time I turn on my phone. But so just little details on the iris and how that color works. But the function of the iris is to operate the pupil, right? So when the when the uh, iris contracts, the pupil opens, and when it releases, it narrows down the the pupil. And that helps to, to re, um, regulate the amount of light that's getting into your eyeball. So when it's really bright out, you want a smaller pupil. When it's really dim out, you need a bigger pupil to let more light in. Um, the lens is right behind the pupil, and it's a structure that needs to be able to bend. And so you'll notice that there's muscles attached to it at the top and the bottom of the eyeball. Um, and that allows the 
lens to um, retract or contract, depending on how close the object is to your face. So in this picture, that candle looks pretty close to this eyeball, so that lens is going to have to bend to make sure that it's casting the light from that candle, not just the flame light, but the whole, you know, the whole structure, back onto the back of the eyeball in focus. So you can see it in the back of the eyeball there, upside down, landing in focus. Um, that's the job of the lens, is to contract and, and accommodate so that the light that's coming in through the pupil lands in focus back on the retina. And you'll notice it flipped over as it passed through. Um, part of what flips the light over as it goes through your eye is the pupil. It's a little, it's a little opening, and so as as light goes through small openings, it flips them over. Um, if you happen to have gotten to experience the eclipse a few years ago, you might have gone outside with a a paper with a hole in it and looked at the reflection or not the reflection, the shadow um, that was uh, the light that was being cast through that pinhole onto the ground, um, and it was upside down. Because when light passes through pinholes, it flips upside down. So when it lands on the back of the retina, it's going to be upside down. The good news is your brain expects it to come in upside down, so don't worry. You're used to it. Um, so it lands in the back in focus on the retina. The retina is the part of the eye that has the light receiving cells. So it's actually going to collect the light information and convey it up to the brain. Um, now this picture is two dimensional, so you're seeing the retina around the top and the bottom, but th remember that the eye is a globe, right? So the retina coats all the, all the sides, tops, bottom, everything reaching forward towards the lens, but not all the way up to the lens. The point of fixation is going to land on the fovea. So whatever you're intently looking at will land on the fovea. The fovea is the part of your retina that has the most acute cells for collecting the most detailed information. So let's talk about the retina in a little bit more detail. All right, so the light came through the pupil, passed through the lens, made it through this vitreous humor kind of gel that's in your eyeball, and now is landing on the retina. So we see these white arrows with the black outline, and what's really important to notice is that the light still has to penetrate through all the layers of the cells before it actually hits the light receiving cells, the rods and the cones. Um, so just like everything else in our brain, it's you know it seems like information has to go as far away from its source as possible for processing, um, but that's how it works. So the light penetrates back to the very, very back of the retina, and then as it's... Um, collected by its appropriate cells, they pass the information back up through the layers and out to the brain. So in the very bottom you see, in the very back part of the eye, you see those rods and cones. The, the rods are green, the cones are red in this picture. That is not what color they are in real life. <laughs> they are all the same color in real life. And if you look at them, you see, oh, well, the rods are skinny and the cones are fat. Well, yeah, basically. But here we have, this one's, it's colorized. So the, in this case, um, you know, the rods are the blue, the, um, sorry, the rods are the yellow objects and the cones are the blue objects. So they did color code it for us. But if you look at them, some of those rods look like they have a little bit of swelling to them. Some of those cones look sort of like they don't have any swelling to them. So it's probably not super surprising if I tell you that it's, it was only recently that researchers discovered that dogs have rods and cones. They had initially thought dogs only had rods because they couldn't find them. They don't have as many as we have. Um, rods are in charge of processing black and white shades of gray, things like that. They're really good at detecting motion. Even if it's in your peripheral vision, you'll notice motion thanks to the rods. Um, all, all of our peripheral vision is almost exclusively collected by rods. So you pretty much in your peripheral vision see basically black and white. The great thing is your brain knows what those objects are in your peripheral vision, and oftentimes you'll per perceive it like it's in color, but in reality, you're not collecting the color information. Um, what I like to do in class is illustrate that. I, I take a nice, bright highlighter pen. You know how bright and neon those are. So it seems like you would be able to detect the color, right? And I move over, I get a student to come and volunteer. Their reward is they get a highlighter pen, so I'm not, you know, um, what would you say, taking advantage of them, right? So I stand over here and behind them. I move my hand into their peripheral vision, and I say, tell me when you can see it 
name the color as soon as you can, right? And keep your eyes fixated forward. And they can see it way over on the side. They say, I see it. But it comes up to almost like here before they can say pink or blue or green or whatever color I'm holding up, right? Peripheral vision, we sometimes feel like we can see the color, but it might be that we're uh, interpreting the color rather than seeing it. Our rods work really well, even in dim light. And so after dark, you tend to not have very good visual, uh, color vision either because we're relying on our, on our rods at night. The cones, I'm sure you've already gathered, they're in charge of color. So we need, um, we need our cones to fire in response to the input or we're not going to detect color. Um, they're really good at sharp detail. They can find the edges and do a really good job of giving us the detail that we need. They need a lot of bright light to work well. You know how your parents always told you, don't read in that dark light, stuff like that. We really we do need bright light for our color receptors to work effectively. It turns out that they discovered uh, anatomically the dogs do have cones, and then they figured out behaviorally which cones. Turns out they don't have all the color cones that we have. We have some cones that detect red and green, and we have some cones that detect blue and yellow. Um, dogs seem to only have the blue and yellow ones. So dogs can't tell the difference between red things and green things, but they can tell the difference between um, blue, yellow, brown, and then shades of black and white. All right. So it labels all of our parts, except for I've added this new one labeled blind spot. So as your rods and cones are sending out their message up through the um, bipolar cells and the ganglion cells that are the different layers of our retina. They all send out axons to exit the eye and ultimately take this visual information up to the brain. Where all those axons exit the eye, we have a blind spot. It turns out that our eyeball goes ahead and takes advantage of that blind spot and puts all the vascular structures at that same hole. So you'll see that all the veins and stuff are coming in and going out of the eye through that same hole. So there's this little area where you literally have no receptor cells for collecting information. And they're on opposite positions on your two eyes. So if we look at um, this object, sorry, close your left eye. So close your left eye, fixate on the dot. So I'm closing my left eye, I'm fixating on the dot. I'm nice and close to my screen, and I gotta tell you what, I cannot see that car at all. When I'm in class, sometimes the image is big enough that I can see parts of the car. I Literally, if I have my left eye closed and I'm looking at that dot, as I'm nodding my head while I talk, I'm seeing like a little bit of the trunk or something, but basically it's gone. I can't see it. I know it's there. I guess I could fill it in with assumptions, but I literally nothing's being collected because what is happening is with my left eye closed, that leaves that car landing on my blind spot in my right eye. So it's, we're not collecting any information. Um, the good news is when your eyes are open, now fixate on the dot. And you'll notice, oh, you can basically see the car. It's still, it's not perfect for me, but I at least basically can see it. And that's because it's falling on the, the part of the left eye that doesn't have the blind spot. So normally with both of your eyes open, you don't notice that you have a blind spot. It's when you close eyes and things like that. So... We do have a blind spot where the optic nerve leaves the eye. So the optic nerve is all those um, axons that are going to carry the information up to the brain. We call that the optic nerve. And it's a very dense bundle of all these axons. Now, I mentioned this before when we talked about Chapter 2, that there's an optic chiasm where the um, optic nerves of the two eyes appear to crisscross. But it turns out half of each eyeball crisscrosses to the other side of the brain and half of the nerves stay on the same side. And so that's how we end up with our um, visual fields switching sides. If you're fixating on that dot, the pencil will land in the left hemisphere and the apple will learn, land in the right hemisphere. Um, so visual fields are what switch sides. And that's why. All right, what about color vision? I already talked a little bit about um, color vision, so let's get a little bit more specific as far as theories that govern our ability to see color. 
Jung and Hemholtz, oh, this is 1860s or 70s, they developed a trichromatic theory of how we detect um, color. They said that we have three types of cones, just like your TV has three, or your, um, your computer or your um, phone. They, there are three types of diodes in those, um, and they provide these different colors. Modern TVs have actually started to have, um, some of them have yellow diodes, which is new, and some of them have black diodes. So your blacks are deeper, darker blacks. So um, we're getting a little fancier than the human eye with actual electronics. So um, it's kind of harder to compare them to, to electronics anymore. We still only have the three types of cones. Um, we do have black and white, though. You have to admit, we have the rods. So I guess we're more advanced than most TVs because we do have black. Um, according to Young Helmholtz, the way that we uh, detect the rainbow is that these three types of cones combine to make different colors. If you ever uh, worked in theater, right, either you got to put on a production in high school or something, or you ran the lights during that, you know that the lights in a theater are these three colors. And when you combine all of them, you end up with white. If you combine some of them, then you end up with these shades, right? So the red and the green make the yellow. So the green and the blue make the turquoise. I think that actually has a name. It's not cyan. Um, anyway, so you can combine them to end up with the uh, secondary colors. And so young Helmholtz thought this is how we detect vision. But we have a small problem with that, and that is how colorblindness works. I already mentioned that our dogs are colorblind for red and for green. That's actually the most common kind of colorblindness. It's actually just called color deficiency. Um, there are very few people in the world who are colorblind and can only see in black and white and gray. Most are color deficient. And in fact, they oftentimes aren't even colorblind for the thing that they're deficient for. They just have trouble with distinguishing reds from greens. Dogs are truly red, green, color blind. They can't see those colors um, as different. They just look like brown to them. For us, we may just be deficient. And so we may be able to kind of tell that red and green are different from each other, but there may be different shades of brown or something. So there are these fancy tests, Yishihara tests, um, that allow us to determine whether a person has trouble with red and green. Um, so the one on the top, hopefully you're seeing the number 45 in that pan panel. Um, and you'll notice that the four and the five are made out of shades of red. And the background is made up of mostly shades of green with a little bit of a few that are kind of bluish, right? Um, so you can kind of tell that um, you know, even if you were red, green, colorblind, you probably would be able to tell that there are those blue dots in there, and then a whole bunch of other dots that are just the same, and you wouldn't see the 45. You would just see like a panel with um, a bunch of dots that are all shades of the same color, and then some blue dots. Um, on the bottom, you see the, for those of us who have red-green color vision that's intact, we see a 74. Um, people who have, are red-green color deficient tend to report that they're seeing a 21 because they're mostly noticing the balls that are bluish. Um, if you look through there, you'll see, oh, wait, some of those are kind of bluish, and then others are greenish. If you're red-green colorblind, you're not going to be able to see those greenish ones, so you'll end up with the 21. This depends on what we call an, the opponent process theory. Um, in this theory, the idea is that you have, um, you know, the achromatic sy system of vision that have, has nothing to do with color but just tells you how bright um, the incoming light is. And then you have the chromatic system, which is telling us yellow versus blue and red versus green. And there's a lot of evidence that we have these um, you know, different cones that detect red and green and, and yellow and blue. So the attempt to bring together young Helmholtz and opponent process has been difficult because color blindness and the fact that we have cones that seem to fire in response to red and green. Red. Another way, sorry, another way that we can um, tell that it's probably the opponent processing theory makes a lot of sense is that um, when we overstimulated your visual, you know, your, your color receptors, um, look at use, using that reddish orange background with those greenish yellow birds, we got the opponent colors as our after image. So that's another way to know that probably the opponent processing theory makes a lot of sense. 
Um, so most of the modern theories are are focusing on the opponent process theory. Like I said, the young Helmholtz is, you know, can't even do the map, 150 years old. So they, um, they definitely explained how we can make things seem white or how we can make things seem yellow or things like that by mixing white. But I don't think they described our visual system very well. All right, so let's go ahead and take a stop here and we'll come back, speaking of hearing, and talk about hearing slash audition. <laughs> 